Good morning and welcome to Pot Up with Matthews in the morning from the Crime Prevention Security System Studios. Large enough to serve you, small enough to care. A Wednesday edition uh, of the program. We're glad you're along for the ride. Uh, we got a great show lined up for you today. We got Alex Marvez from Sirius NFL, uh, also a Pro Football Hall of Fame voter. And then in the second half of the program, we're going to have former Gator defensive back, All-American Lawrence Wright. But first, we're going to go to the Titan Amara hotline, and we're joined by Alex Marvez. Alex, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Hey, if I'm the warm-up act to Lawrence Wright, I know that I'm doing okay. What a great Gator, just like you. That's got me fired up. And, hey, I'm fired up about the 2020 NFL draft. Shane, you and I talked a little bit off air. I think the presentation was amazing. I thought it really captured a lot of human elements that are sometimes lost in other drafts. I thought even Roger Goodell, who at times doesn't come across very well in these settings, I think you saw a little bit of a different side of him, you know, a little bit more of a human side. And, and I know Roger from, from, you know, doing the NFL for 26 years, and I have a very good relationship with him, so maybe I'm, I'm biased. But I, I think all in all, this was a draft that people watched. It was a welcome relief from everything going on in the world. And, of course, 255 players now open to follow their NFL dreams once they can finally report, whenever that is, Shane. Exactly. But as you mentioned, I thought I, I'm not a big guy who watches the draft, maybe the first five or six picks, but I was really enamored this year. I thought the best part of it was having cameras in all the kids' houses to see their family members, how they react. I thought it was cool how they had cameras. Uh, also in the general managers, the head coaches with their kids sitting there. Um, I know we probably won't ever see this again because they make too much money having the draft in Vegas or New York <laughs> or wherever. But uh, is there any possibility that they may do this? I mean, I just thought it was so much better than walk, walk, watching a kid walk across the stage with his jersey and, and hugging Roger Goodell to see him with his family in his, on his couch in his living room, the reaction. Yeah, you know, this is a toughie because I'll be honest, sometimes, you know, a draft, it's as close as some people are going to get to an NFL experience. And, you know, I was at the first one in Philadelphia that was outside Radio City Music Hall, and I've done the ones in New York for a number of years. And the one in Philadelphia, you know, Shane, that's the one that started, you know, in Chicago, of course, and, and Chicago is the one that, you know, began the NFL's tour of different cities where they would bring the draft. And, you know, it, it was interesting because they had the NFL experience, uh, you know, at, at a giant park in downtown Chicago. And, you know, so it's cool in that, in that people get to see things that they normally wouldn't. You know, they have a lot of exhibits. It's very family friendly. And, you know, and I mentioned Philadelphia because you had, you know, 250,000 people over a three day period, you know, attend the draft. Zero arrests, by the way, which was unbelievable. <laughs> but it just showed, wow, the power of the NFL and an incredible marketing tool for them. What I could see Shane happening is, and look, the league is, you know, they want it, they want, they love the glitz, they love the glamour, the extravaganza, the red carpet, all those things that, that go with the traditional draft. But what I could see is maybe day three of the draft, uh, rather than having zoo animals make picks like we had before and you know, some of the gimmicky things that went on, maybe that's where we're going to start to get, you know, a little bit more of the, the Zoom experience going on. Maybe even day two of the draft, maybe you just cut down on the number of players who are invited for day one and you try to limit it to maybe the top 15 prospects, and you roll the dice that all these players are going to be selected in the first round, I think, you know, we can pretty much pinpoint that. I mean, I don't think there was a single prospect that you saw was a guaranteed first-round pick who ended up going in round two. So maybe that's the way they go. But listen, the league is very well aware of how well-received this draft was, and it was the most-watched draft in the history of the NFL, up, you know, significantly from 2018, which set the previous high. So, Shane, I think there is something that the NFL is going to do there, but predicting anything at this point, brother, I'm just hoping we could even have an outdoor draft in 2021, and there's no guarantees of that either, unfortunately. Very true. We're speaking with Alex Marvez. You can follow him on Twitter at, at Alex Marvez, Sirius XM NFL radio host. Alex, so you kind of digested what happened the three days. Tell me who you think, which organization had the best draft and who had the worst draft? Well, I think that when it comes to, you know, I, I like, you know, it's interesting because I'm actually a pretty darn positive for a lot of these teams, and it's because they filled needs, right? And Shane, that doesn't mean that they're going to hit on these picks and that the needs are ultimately filled, but this was a need draft. You know, Detroit at number three, Jeffrey Okuda, right? They needed a, a cornerback, you know, of course, because we, we assume going in Joe Burrow one to Cincinnati, Chase Young two to Washington, no shock there. 
it, it was almost a draft by the numbers in that regard, right, with teams that were filling needs. I, I like what Jacksonville did because I, it, because I think that, you know, C.J. Henderson and, and, you know, Chase on from LSU, those guys could be, uh, you know, cornerstone players for them uh, for years to come. And I'm talking about Caleb on Chase on. Uh, the, the edge rusher. Actually, he's a, a little bit of everything at linebacker. He's only started 16 games uh, for the Tigers, and, and this guy's going to be pretty good. And I, I thought they addressed some things on their roster that were a little bit shaky. Uh, you know, the one draft that I, that, you, that everyone is going to question, well, two of them. First, the Green Bay Packers. And <laughs> Shane, this one, is, uh, this one was interesting because they could spin it whatever way they want about Jordan Love, but the reality is that for the first time in Aaron Rodgers' NFL career, the clock is ticking. And, you know, for his time in Green Bay, how is he going to respond to that? You see a team that's making itself over. They didn't draft a single wide receiver to give him help. You know, Aaron, I mean, and, and it's interesting, Shane, it, it, since he was selected in 2005, the Packers have never spent a first round pick on a running back, wide receiver or tight end. They've wow. never helped surround him. Yeah, because, oh, wow, Aaron can carry us, right? Well, now it's a very different Packers team. It looks like they're trying to win running the football, playing defense, not putting the football in Aaron Rodgers' hand. So I, I don't I don't want to say it's not going to end well. I just don't think Aaron Rodgers is going to end his career in Green Bay like a lot of us a lot of us thought was a possibility. So that Jordan Love pick, it doesn't make the Packers any better, in my opinion, in 2020 while the window is still open for A-Rod to get another Super Bowl title. The other pick that's obviously controversial is the one in Philadelphia involving Jalen Hurts. You just mm-hmm. gave Carson Wentz $109 million guaranteed last year as part of a contract extension. You, uh, Assuming you want to keep the football in his hand, right? You don't necessarily <laughs> want to take him out. You want to be able to utilize him. It's almost like when you had Tom Brady in his prime and you're sending him out of a game. Huh? What? So I, that's why that one was a little bit interesting to me, and especially the logic of Howie Roseman saying, you know, the general manager saying, hey, look, we want to become a quarterback factory. Well, I, I think back before, you know, the collective bargaining agreement was in and all these restrictions were made on practice, it's one thing. Now it is so difficult to develop a backup quarterback in this league, Shane, and, and you know it from, from having been there. The snaps are so limited. It, it's mm-hmm. just really hard. So I think those are some things to consider. Like that one for the Eagles to me was just a very curious pick. Maybe they have a, a package in mind for Jalen Hurts, and that's all, that's all well and good. Don't get me wrong. But when we talk like Taysom Hill, let's not forget, Taysom Hill was an undrafted college free agent, okay, right. who, who they've converted into a jack-of-all-trades, not a second-round pick for a team, again, that you would think is close. And there's one caveat I want to say about all these things that I'm talking about here. Shane, I think it in, because this hasn't happened since 2011, the lack of an off-season program, that was back during the lockout. This year, I know that there's a virtual off-season program, and I talked with Adam Troutman, the, the New Orleans Saints tight end, just selected in the third round of the University of Dayton. He was telling me, hey, look, they're going to send me a tablet. Uh, we're going to go over some things in the playbook. And he was pretty much told, don't expect to, to come into camp until at least July, and that's if they can hold camp as normal. I don't know if NFL teams are going to be able to hold camp as normal. So I think projecting rookies to make a huge impact out of any year, this might be a really tough year for that to happen. That's why I'm bullish on a team like the Kansas City Chiefs that returned so many starters and, and to keep Sammy Watkins and to resign a former Gator to Marcus Robinson this offseason among moves that they made. I think that that's so significant because I think the teams that have experience playing together are going to be the one that, that benefit in absence of the offseason programs the way that they are normally and perhaps a truncated training camp. We're speaking with Alex Marvez. Alex, you know, the SEC, I think, had 64 players selected. <laughs> And that was just in the first – that was just the first two rounds. No, all 64 in the first two rounds. That was it. Oh, and they were all from two. LSU and Alabama. It was really weird. I, it was just <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, the, the SEC continues to dominate the draft. But let's talk, let's talk about the three, three teams here in the state of Florida. The Dolphins take Tua. How would you rate their draft? Well, that's a, the big question is the medical. And, and, Shane, I'm not a doctor, nor do I play one on your podcast. But, uh, you know, if they are, are comfortable with the medical, and it's not just to his hip, it's having two ankle surgeries, it, it's, you know, an arm injury, a wrist injury uh, it, that he suffered at Alabama as well. If you're confident that this young man doesn't have a, a penchant for injuries, and that's something that's hard to quantify, uh, if it's, and I don't think it's necessarily reckless playing style, but if you feel good that, that he's at no greater risk of re-injuring his hip playing for you, it's an outstanding pick. I mean, it's interesting in that he's the first left-handed quarterback that we're going to have in this league since Kellen Moore uh, back in the 2015 season. 
We haven't had a left-handed quarterback since. It will require the Dolphins to do some things a little bit differently. It places a greater emphasis on the right tackle than the left tackle. But, you know, speaking of left tackles, they did draft Austin Jackson of Southern Cal. I believe he's 20 years old. That's it. Someone who, you know, should be able to develop into a great replacement for Laramie Tunsil down the road. And uh, they did draft a, a cornerback from Auburn. Yes, another SEC guy. Talk about Noe McNagney, uh, you know, who's just really, really fast. His parents, in fact, both, uh, you know, world-class caliber sprinters and the good genetics from him. So I think the Dolphins helped themselves. The big question there, Shane, again, no off-season program, virtual off-season program, and so much change on the coaching staff. There was change on the roster, huge amounts of new players coming in. I think everyone's got to get name tags when they're finally able to go to team headquarters, and it's going to take some time for everyone to get to know each other. But the Dolphins, there's no question. You look at this roster, a zillion times better than it was last year. Tampa Bay, obviously a lot of excitement with Brady and Grant going to uh, be there. How do you like this team and what they did in the draft? I love the Tristan Wirfs acquisition, right? Moving up a spot, you know, with San Francisco because the Dolphins apparently were sniffing around on, on Tristan Wirfs. And, you know, San Francisco didn't want to fall too far because they had their eyes on South Carolina's Javon Kinlaw. So, you know, for Tampa Bay now to get a, a right tackle, someone who will try to compete for start, you know, to start on day one, I think that was fantastic for them in the draft. Of course, a lot of folks are going to be wondering, why didn't you take a running back earlier on? Uh, they do have confidence in Ronald Jones. And I think, too, running back is an area where there may be some talent available later on that they're going to be able to add. We'll see how that plays out. Um, it's clear that this is a very tight end-centric offense at this point, and they're going to be trying to utilize that moving ahead. Antoine Winfield Jr., I mean, he's a little undersized, and he had a, an injury history in Minnesota. But when he was healthy in 2019, so the guy had seven interceptions. He's, he's a ball hawk. And, the, and, you know, they, and by the way, the Bucks did address the running back position, Keyshawn Vaughn, in the third round. We'll see what he's able to do, you know, splitting snaps with Rojo. But, I mean, this was a team. They have, you know, what I love about it now, you know, is that they have a vision. And under Bruce Arians and Jason Light, they're, you know, and, and now they're, the Bucks are showing why did they keep Jason Light. You know, he survived Lovey Smith. He survived Dirk Cutter. So, clearly, he's doing something right here, working with a head coach, giving him pieces that the head coach, you know, can use. And I think on top of that, too, you know, this is a team, as, as Bruce Arians would say, no risk it, no biscuit. Well, they're, you know, what they're doing now, going for it all basically this year and next year with Brady and Gronk, I think that's a tremendous thing for Tampa Bay. And, you know, good for them. You know, rather than say, oh, well, we're going to re-sign Jameis and give it another year or we're going to draft a quarterback. No, they feel they can compete now. And when you look at them on paper, this is the best Bucks team we've seen in a long time. I agree. The Jags, uh, you know, address defense a lot in their draft. I do like the C.J. Henderson pick, but – they didn't really get a whole lot of guys that can score touchdowns to help Gardner Minshew. Yeah, and this is uh, – so let me just uh, – I will put a little caveat to this. Uh, you know, Tony Khan, uh, you know, son of Shad Khan, uh, is my boss at All Elite Wrestling. So, uh, you know, I look at the Jaguars a little bit differently, uh, maybe than some others. And I just get a feeling that this is a team that is planning to win more games on defense than anything else. It, it is a clearinghouse year. I mean, look, you have Leonard Fournette, who was being shopped before the draft, no takers. Yannick Ngakwe, nobody wanted to give up the draft capital or, or the, uh, the, you know, give him the type of contract that he was looking for. I think both of these guys may end up being traded for picks in 2021. I mean, the one thing for and, – and it's going to be interesting for Gardner because I do think this is his year to, to prove it. It's a make-or-break year for Gardner Minshew. This is a second NFL season. And, you know, the Jags haven't signed Cam Newton. They haven't done anything major. They did draft a Jake Luton out of Oregon State as a developmental quarterback potentially. But, but let's be real here. This is Gardner Minshew's chance to try to get this thing going. And we're going to see they did draft LaVisca Chenault, someone who some projected as a first-round pick, the Colorado wide receiver in the second round. But I think the way that they're trying to win games in Jacksonville is going to be running the football, playing defense. They're going old-school style there for the Jags. But it's going to take a little time. And I know Jags fans, it's disappointing because it's, it was just such a miserable decade for this team with the exception of, the, you know, the 2017 campaign. But my feeling is that Jacksonville now, I, I think they're on the right track. And, and I do say this as well. You know, you've got now two former NFL head coaches and two former offensive coordinators, Jay Gruden, who's the OC now, and also, you know, Ben McAdoo coming over, former Giants head coach, who's been an OC. You've got two guys there that are really bright. And I think that, that that's the thing that is going to help out this team Having some really innovative offensive minds, I think that's going to help Gardner Minshew compensate for really that lack of, of incredible firepower, you would have to say, uh, when it comes to the Jags' offense. 
Alex, final thing for you. Gators get seven guys drafted uh, this year. Talk a little bit about each one and how they fit into the teams that they, they, were, they were selected by. Well, C.J. Henderson was not going to get past the Raiders at number 12, from what I understand. You know, that was that was the guy that they were going to actually be looking at um, at that point, uh, you know, or at least, you know, at least that was what I heard uh, on the Coconut Telegraph, as Jimmy Buffett would say. But, I mean, that's essentially what, what I was hearing about Henderson. So he goes to Jacksonville at nine. He was also uh, in the crosshairs of the Atlanta Falcons, but they could not find a way to move up to get him and said they draft uh, A.J. Terrell, the, the Clemson cornerback. So that's who's there. Jabari Zuniga comes off the board to the New York Jets. Shane, you know this as well as I do. If, if Jabari was able to stay healthy, didn't have that ankle sprain last year, this is a double-digit sack guy. I mean, I, I think, you know, a, a lot of people think boom or bust. I just know, and, and from talking to his teammates, you know, through this process, just, you know, how much he tried to play last year. I mean, Jonathan Grenard told me, hey, I, we told him, shut it down. Stop trying to come back after being hurt for, for a few weeks. And then, you know, you're not healthy. And then you get hurt again. And you, and you have another setback and you can't play. So it just 2019 didn't come together for Jabari. I think he's got a legit chance, though, in that Greg Williams defense to make an impact for the Jets. Speaking of Grenard, he goes to Houston. There's worse places to be when you got J.J. Watt and would be merciless on your defense. So he's going to have a chance to work in some rotational stuff, you know, really quickly off the bat. Uh, Freddie Swain, uh, he, listen, a guy was an outstanding in the three-cone drill, 7.05 seconds. I am a big Freddie Swain guy. He's going to Seattle. Seattle needs help at the receiver position. I could see uh, him sticking on the roster there. I could also see Tyree Cleveland sticking uh, with the uh, with the Denver Broncos. Again, incredible athleticism. You're talking about a guy, uh, you know, who has a 39 and a half inch vertical. I mean, he should be able. He should be someone who's able to stick in Denver. And I think that's pretty much covering uh, covering our class this year. Do they cover well, all the Gators? Van Jefferson. I don't know if we spoke with him. I, oh I yeah, saying, that's right. Van Jefferson. Yes. I think is an ideal fit for what Sean McVay and those guys do with the L.A. Rams. Thank you. Thank you. I was going through my list here, and I got I to gotta put – I didn't have a college next to Van's name. You know, he was the guy – so, I, you know, obviously I do a lot of interviews with Sirius XM NFL Radio, and Van was at the Reese's Senior Bowl. And so when I would ask a corner, who was the best wide receiver you went against at the Reese's Senior Bowl, every single corner, and I talked to about seven or eight of them, all said Van Jefferson. They wow. just said – and the guy's, the guy's a technician, man. I mean, of course – you know, his pop, Sean Jefferson, you know, longtime NFL wide receiver, Jets wide receivers coach. I mean, Shane, he's, you know, he comes from the right place. He took full advantage of his two years at, at UF after transferring, uh, you know, from Ole Miss. I, I mean, I, I'm a huge Van Jefferson fan, and you're right. I mean, there's comparisons made to Cooper Cup in the style that he plays. So, you know, he's got an opportunity there with Brandon Cooks being traded from the Rams to the Houston Texans. And the Rams, you know, we'll see if McVay, if he's still going to run a lot of 11 personnel, you know, three receivers, one back, or if he's going to start using, you know, more 12 like he did in December featuring Tyler Higby in a big role. So we'll see. But I think there's an opportunity for Van, especially Josh Reynolds entering the final year of his contract, of him working in that rotation with Robert Woods, with Cooper Cup. And, yes, Sean McVay, he knows how to use his talent. Van Jefferson should be a great pro. Well, Alex, we appreciate you joining the program, my man. Great stuff as always. Be safe, and we'll talk to you soon. Awesome, Shane. Anytime for you, baby. Thank you. That's Alex Marvez. You can check him out on Sirius XM NFL Radio. When we come back, we're going to take our first time out of the program. When we come back, we'll be joined by former Gator defensive back, the l Dog, Lawrence Wright. You're watching and listening to Pot Up with Matthews in the Morning from the Crime Prevention Security System Studios. We'll be right back. We want to take this moment to thank all our sponsors who keep the show going and pay the bills. Let's give them something to show for now. Our gridiron sponsors are Crime Prevention Security, small enough to serve you, large enough to care. Titan MRI, Gainesville's only locally owned and operated MRI facility. Peachland Dentistry, Gator Nation's number one choice for dentistry in Port Charlotte and surrounding areas. Area Rug Masters, your number one choice for rug cleaning. And Pound Her, preferred personal injury attorneys. Our touchdown sponsors are Gator BTW, Campus USA Credit Union, Celebration Point Town Center, Tropical Smoothie Cafe, The Keys Grill and Piano Bar, UF Mover Guys, The Digital Mortgage Guy, Adams Ribs, Cloud Nine Spa, Cold Stone Creamery, Gator Domino's, Celebrate 
Primary Care, Center State Bank. If you are interested in promoting your business on the show, you can visit our website, potupwithshane.com, and click on the Advertise button or call Freddie Weeby at 352-284-3733. Again, thank you for all the great businesses that support the show. Please remember, if you like what we are doing here, thank our sponsors and support the businesses that support us. He's locking, no locking. He's going for the end zone. He's got a touchdown! Welcome back to Pod Up with Matthews in the morning from the Crime Prevention Security System Studios. Large enough to serve you, small enough to care. I want to thank Alex Morvez for joining the program. Always gives us great insight on what's going on in the National Football League. Hope to be joined by Lawrence right here momentarily. But first, Celebration Point is where the Gators come to celebrate. With premium brands like Bass Pro Shop, Palmetto Moon, Skechers, Starbucks, the Keys Grill and Piano Bar, Select Shade, Regal Cinemas, and coming soon, the HBC's new restaurant, Spurrier's Gridiron Grill. We will see you at Celebration Point where the Gators come to celebrate. Um, let's get to our uh, play of the day, which is this day in sports, brought to you by Area Rug Masters. Is your whole family stuck at home and tracking in more than usual? Take your rugs to Area Rug Masters for a BOGO rug cleaning. When you mention the code Shane, call 352-448-5999. And uh, this day in sports, back in 1986, Roger Clemens of the Boston Red Sox strikes out 20 Seattle Mariners. That's a lot of dudes to be striking out. Um, so that was this day in sports brought to you by Area Rug Masters. Um, like I said, we're hoping to be joined by Lawrence Wright, waiting for him to call into the program. In the meantime, uh, we'll take your text or calls. We have a couple of Facebook Live comments brought to you by Pound Hurt, your preferred business interruption attorneys. And uh, Kyle says, good morning. Rick says, another year, and I didn't get drafted. Well, Rick, I'm still waiting to get drafted as well. I was not drafted, and it stinks when you're, not, when you're waiting on that phone call and it never comes. Um, Scott says, L Dog, love you. Glad you stayed a Gator. And now to the Titan MR hotline. We're joined by Gator Great, Jim Thorpe Award winner, Lawrence Wright. Lawrence, good morning. How are you, buddy? Good morning. How are you guys doing this morning? Doing well. Uh, technology got us a little bit there, but uh, let's get started. You know, Lawrence, you grew up down in South Florida uh, back in the day when the Miami Hurricanes were, were pretty good. Uh, did you always want to be a Gator or, or were you a Miami no, Hurricane? No, no, man. I was, a, I was always a Miami Hurricane growing up. And uh, the story is that I was 10 points from passing my SAT test. And uh, on the last one, I, w I was short. I took it about four times and I'm still 10 points short. So it, I guess it was my destiny lining up with the Gators because I signed with Miami coming out of high school. And uh, uh, it allowed me to go to Valley Forge Military Academy in Wayne, Pennsylvania for a, a half a semester and play football and also take the test was able to pass, and then I uh, ventured off to, to go visit other schools and visit the Gators again, and Coach Red, and most of Coach Spurrier convinced me that, uh, you know, Miami have won a lot of championships, yet you, you really want to be a part of something that's first ever. And that's the thing that got me, because I always like a challenge. And uh, so that was, the, that was the deal breaker. Either you want to be a part of something first ever, or you want to be a part of something that's add on to the history. So we was able to be the, the number one class to come in and then the number one class to exit. So that was history in the making. Yeah. So, Lawrence, talk a little bit about, you know, you're a part of two of the, the best teams. Obviously, you know, the Gator Nation and people around the country all know about the 96 National Championship team. But that 95 team was very special as well. Uh, uh -huh. which, which one of those teams do you think was better, 95 or 96? Uh, uh, well, schemes was a little bit different. I think the 95 team had, uh, you know, a, a great bit of, uh, talent. And, um, but I still think that, you know, how you, you, you maybe, uh, play away from just being dominant. We was pretty dominant, but that the last game didn't show well. So that's 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 what you know put a sour, uh, 
you know, sour taste in our mouth for them being like the competitively greatest because we went undefeated all the way through the through the year except that last game. We kind of like uh, doodled on the money. <laughs> so, so uh, I mean, but besides that, shoot, 95 and 96 was, was pretty great. And then our 96 team, we lost to Florida State. So in a regular season, and had a uh, and had a redemption uh, opportunity. So still, both of those classes was uh, top notch. And when you look back, you know, back when we played, you know, the, the two big games I guess uh, on the schedule each year was Tennessee, because back back in the early '90s, you know, Tennessee was very dominant, and also yeah. Florida State. Right. Which one of those two games, you know, between Tennessee and Florida State? Uh, would you say were the bigger game for you personally? Uh, oh man, it's, it's it's a draw because shoot, you had to get up for both of them, you know, and you and uh, I had to play well because they 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 had a dominant running game and we we had to be able to stop the run, and then uh, for the sake of more of a spread concept, so we had to stop the pass. So it, it was like a balance because both of them was prevalent and one was our biggest rival um, in the state and the other one you know they just hated our guts so it, it's it's all the same you know you can't certain things you can't separate like tennessee florida state you can't separate those two because we don't like them both that one is the was the number one in the sec and our division and the other one was uh the number one in the state for us to, to beat them because we didn't play Miami. So, okay, so you know you watch a lot of football with the targeting. How many games would Lawrence Wright got kicked out? Uh, if you were I wouldn't, I, would, I wouldn't have made it. I wouldn't have made you it. Wouldn't have made. <laughs> no, nah, I wouldn't made it. I wouldn't made it because it's bullshit. You know, first of all, you know if, if anybody gonna say that you have to uh, get control of yourself. Uh, and and the, and you give the defense player a penalty, and then you kick him out of the game. That's bullshit. That's not a real game. The game is that you know, we need to get better equipment. Have these guys to wear better equipment and 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 be more better prepared that they can take a bruising hit. Because you know that's a part of the game. You signed up for it. Don't try and change the rules or not. It's a gladiator sport. Don't try to make it a flag football. It's not flag football. You sign up for it. That's why you train over the off season to to be prepared to be able to make uh, your body can take that kind of contact, kick that kind of pounding. And uh, you know that's just my thought. You know I'm 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 not I'm not sensitive to you know the modern day football you know uh, concept. You know and and then they benefit and say they're better athletes or they or they they're definitely not tough. So you know I don't I don't too much. I wouldn't have made it. Because, you know, I'm going for the head every time. <laughs> and, and, and speaking of that, would you say the hit on Tennessee's Joey Kent was the hardest hit you had when you were here as a player? Not really. You remember, you remember when um, uh, your uh, 94. I was gone. 94, you was gone. But it was a year we went to Auburn. And uh, um, we went to Auburn. And we was, we was going to be up 21 was going to be up 21-0. Danny threw an interception. <laughs> uh, he threw an interception, and the guy returned it for a touchdown. So it was like a 14-point point, point, point swing. Uh, but they was driving in the last seconds with uh, Dan White, I think it was, uh, and Frank Sanders. And they gave me a personal foul penalty on a fourth and, and 10. I hit him so hard inbound, he flew Six yards out of bounds, and they gave me a, a personal foul penalty, and that that, that put them in the um, field goal range to to kick the field goal. Okay, well we're speaking with Lawrence Wright, number four for the national <laughs> title, Jim Thorpe, Jim Thorpe Award winner, also a member of the Florida Hall of Fame, also the Florida Georgia Hall of Fame. Talk a little bit about that. You were inducted in the Florida Georgia Hall of Fame. Uh, how special and how fun it was playing the Dogs over in Jacksonville. Well, you know, those guys didn't have a chance when we was, when we was on our run. Even when they was talented, like when Garrison Hurst, they was talented to be better than us. Or, uh, you know, that, that time in 1990, I want to say two, that is, when, y- when you guys, your senior year, 
uh, uh, to beat them and uh, stop Garrison Hurst from getting 100 yards. And uh, it was just a, a great opportunity for it. But, but, you know, Georgia really never – we really dominated them throughout our whole uh, – our whole time there, they they was never on the clock. Tennessee, um, Auburn, uh, Alabama was the was the premier ones. Georgia, we never even heard of them. <laughs> uh, we're speaking with Lawrence Wright on the Titan MR hotline. On the Titan MR text line, we got a text from Larry for you, uh, Lawrence. He wants to know, um, talk about the bond that your 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 not your your senior class had among one another. Well, I think uh, our freshman class, which ended up being our senior class, was always close, and uh, I think that that was that was the difference maker, because we always did things together. Where there was linemen and defensive backs or running backs and linebackers, we always did things together. Like uh, we'd throw barbecues and we have. I had this famous pool party I threw every year. Uh, uh, and we'll just do things together. We played on an intramural basketball, intramural softball. You know, we just did things together. And and that made us, you know, uh, so close that we understood each other and we will go to bat for each other no matter what. And I kind of think that chemistry and that, that kind of uh, uh, camaraderie has kind of lost its flair because the guys don't really, you know, they don't really hang out with one another like they need to. And, um, you know, they're more of uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook, and it's, it's a me, it's a me sort of like generation, not just, you know, you bonded with your homeboy, you bonded with your teammates, and we having fun together. We don't need nothing else just but us, you know? So that was more of our concept. Yeah, we got a couple of Facebook Live comments here brought to you by Pound Hurt, your preferred business interruption attorneys. Kenyon Weeks says, L Dog was a beast. Danny says, Lawrence had swag. And we need Lawrence with some recruiting help down in Miami. <laughs> well, you know, who said uh, I was a thief? Kenyon Weeks. Oh, I don't know him. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know what I was, what I stole. I don't know what I stole. No, he said you were a beast. Oh, Kenyon beast. Weeks, oh, ba- basketball player Kenyon Weeks. Oh, the basketball player. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was true. Yeah, 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 man. So, you know, it's. It's one of those things, man. Uh, I think uh, at the end of the day, I, I think, you know, it's all leadership and and uh, it's bonding. Uh, it's it's just, you know, you wanting to be the best and working hard and being really determined. And I think we had a special group, even uh, when when you was there, Shane, it was a special group. And it, it wasn't just um, it wasn't just, you know, normal. Um, and even when I remember the the, the SC the, the first ever SC inaugural championship championship game when you was driving down, it's, it's not a doubt in my mind that that we was gonna win the game. You know, mm-hmm. it just so happened that we we didn't make that 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 play, but it would it was no doubt in my mind. We had them on the ropes all along. Jason Odom and Reggie Green was tearing their ends up. Huh? It was tearing, it was tearing yeah. that, they're supposed to be so great, and we was tearing them up. And um, you know that was a spe- that was a special year. And then we came back the next year and and did more and did more. And and our group was like the, I think we we're the only one in in SEC history winning four SEC titles in a row. Um, yeah. Not quite sure, but I think so. Uh, so that we we've been special, and the, the bond that we have, and just doing things that's unorthodox is, is, is was what we was used to, but we talk earned it. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Lawrence, talk a little bit about what it was like playing for Coach Spurrier, and do you have any good Coach Spurrier stories for our listeners? Uh, I, I think the, the biggest thing that I can say uh, 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 about Coach Spurrier, he understood every player. Their, their their strengths, their weaknesses, their their personalities. You know, I was a, you know, like no bullshit type person, but I'm always going to tell the truth and be straight up. And it's kind of, sometimes it's kind of hard to take that kind of personality when you're a head coach or you're a defensive coordinator, you know, because you always going to get what my opinion is, but just not disrespect, but just, just be uh, transparent. And, um, I think he understood 
that if that was your personality, it, he'll let you be who you are as long as you let him be who he is. And he was able to get the best out of everyone uh, individually. He knew every individual player and their personalities and their talent. So he knew what to do and how to handle them. Each one was different, but yet they were still the same. So I think that will make him special besides his offensive geniusness and, and his way of, you know, get the right fit for what we need to do on defense or special teams. I think he, he did that well. And uh, just having the, the, the leadership capability, having the, um, uh, the world all to know what he had and know how to motivate it, know how to inspire it, know how to kick it in the ass when you need to. But, you know, overall, each individual player, he knew them. And I think that's, that's uh, remarkable to understand personalities because you've got 100 different personalities, especially in football. We all are arrogant in, in our own type of way. Um, so, but he knew how to balance all those things. And, and I think that was one of the keys what made us successful. No doubt. We're speaking with Lawrence, right? Lawrence, you, uh, you graduated from the University of Florida with a degree in building construction. Let everybody know what you're up to now uh, down there in South Florida. Well, not just South Florida. We know we been trying to make our mark with, with my Lawrence Wright brand. Um, always been my desire to help people. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm driven by, you know, helping people, you know, especially for the, the lesser ones that, um, that have less, lesser opportunities. So create more opportunities. So we're working on trying to build our, our own uh, construction school so that we can, uh, help our, our, our trade become more of a um, standard industry in how we do things, uh, and especially in the, in, the, in the areas where it's not so uh, prevalent that, you know, you have a skilled trade. So we're trying to make that happen. And then development is what we do, the primary thing we do, uh, and, and construction. And uh, we, 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 we're, we're, we're working on launching a, um, a product for uh, chemicals like bleach and detergent and uh, things like that to help, you know, sanitation and hand sanitizer and stuff like that as well. So, it's, you know, we're trying to do some good things, create jobs, opportunity to, to help people to have a better life. And uh, for me, it's always been, you know, if we don't help, then. Uh, we can't make a difference. So just try to make a difference. And, and I think that's what God created me for, to make a world of difference. So I just try and do that. And uh, and we keep moving. Well, looking at the football program now, Dan Mullins in, uh, has been here for two years. Uh, he's 21 and five. Give me your thoughts on uh, his, his, what he's done to get the program back with that winning attitude. And, uh, you know, I know you – I want to say you were at the Miami-Florida game this year, but I know you've been on the sidelines for several games. <laughs> yeah. Your thoughts on Coach Mullen? Oh, man, that's my main man. I just think that he has uh, a way of uh, getting his players going, uh, just like I say Coach Spurrier would, but in this, this generation. because so these guys are a little bit more different. <laughs> They're a little bit more uh, needy. Um, so in this generation, I can say he is just like Coach Perry was when he came in. You guys begin to win SEC championships and, and things of that nature. And um, uh, he's the same way in the sense of his generation, knowing how to get his players going and have his coaches and all the supporting uh, guys all the way around to make it work. And um, – I think our, our, our athletic director, Scott, has done a great job with selecting a great guy to be able to lead the charge. So, you know, it, it, it's all a team effort, and it always has been, because football is the ultimate team sport. You know, you can't do it. You can't, oh, I got a great head coach, and I have great assistant coaches. So he is able to put all those things together, and other support staff, the trainers, the equipment men, all those people matter. Because if you the guy need a helmet and and, and, and uh, he can't find his helmet or his helmet is broken, he got to have a replacement. 
at the last play of the game and we don't have no more timeouts, what are we going to do? So that person is just as more important as 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 the head coach when you, when the big scheme of things, if, if you look at it as across the board. So uh, on a high level of thinking, you know, he has been uh, a great leader, um, uh, a great uh, example of how to work hard, but also using your brain to work efficiently and smart. And uh, and he was able to put good chemistry together. And I think we got a shot uh, to 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 get back to the championship years and uh, and, and, and do some special things because it's very important. Well, dog. We appreciate you getting up this morning, joining the program. Everybody want to hear what Launch writes up to these days. And uh, you and your family stay safe down there, buddy. And uh, we'll see you hopefully when this football season kicks off. Okay, sir. Bless you, Shane. I really appreciate you. So you need to, uh, everybody out there, they need to listen to Shane uh, <laughs> podcast. They need to increase his numbers. You know, let's go in the millions. The Gator Nation, baby. Let's roll. All right, number four. You take care, old dog. We appreciate right, you. Bye. All right, that's Lawrence Wright joining us on the Titan MR hotline uh, from the Crime Prevention Security System Studios. He's one of the all-time greats, uh, a character and a good dude, and was a tremendous football player here, no doubt about it. Don't forget, tomorrow on the program, we'll be joined by softball, head softball coach Tim Walton, talking about uh, what's going on with his girls and his program. Uh, we'll let, he'll let you know which seniors are coming back, which ones are uh, for, foregoing their senior year. And also former uh, theater football player Shannon Snell will join the program. Be safe out there, folks. That'll be a wrap for today's show. Uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow. Uh, take care.